speaker in the Paul Storr Memorial Lecture Series. Um, before I invite uh, Dean Scott Young, Dean of the College of Business and Economics, to come up and formally introduce the governor, I want to take a minute to just briefly ac acquaint you with the Paul Stora Memorial Endowment Fund. Paul was a beloved colleague in the College of Business and Economics who sadly passed away last November. And the Paul Stora Memorial Endowment Fund is a fund which was established in his memory and which will sponsor an annual lecture series focusing on Canada-US business and economic relations. And at your seats, you should have uh, information sheet that gives you a brief biography of Paul and also uh, some instructions on how to make a donation to the endowment fund uh, to support this lecture series. Uh, after the introduction by Dean Young, the governor will speak for 40 to 45 minutes. Dr. Polaz has kindly agreed to answer questions from the audience for about 25 minutes with the goal of ending the lecture and discussion period at around 5.15. I'm sure many of you want to get home to hear the presidential candidates debate, although I'm personally mystified as why you would want to, but, uh, <laughs> but we should try and stay on schedule. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Scott Young, the Dean of the College of Business and Economics. Thank you, Steve, and welcome, everyone. I'm honored to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Stephen Pollas was appointed governor of the Bank of Canada, effective 3rd of June, 2013, for a term of seven years. As governor, he is also chairman of the board of directors of the bank and a member of the board of directors of the Bank for International Settlements, BIS. He currently chairs both the BIS Audit Committee and the Consultative Council for the Americas. Born in Oshawa, Ontario, Dr. Palaz graduated from Queen's University in 1978 with a bachelor's degree in economics. He received a master's degree in economics in 1979 and a PhD in economics in 1982, both from the University of Western Ontario. Dr. Polas first joined the Bank of Canada in 1981 and occupied a range of increasingly senior positions over a 14-year span, culminating in his appointment as chief of the bank's research department in 1992. After his departure from the bank in 1995, he spent four years with BCA Research, where he served as managing editor of its flagship publication, the International Bank Credit Analyst. Dr. Polas uh, joined Expert Export Development Canada, EDC, in 1999 as Vice President and Chief Economist. From 2008 to 2010, he was Senior Vice President Financing with responsibility for all of EDC's lending programs. In January 2011, he was appointed President and Chief Executive Officer of EDC, a position in which he served until his appointment as Governor of the Bank of Canada. I welcome Dr. Polos. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very nice welcome, and uh, we've certainly enjoyed our day here uh, in Bellingham. Paul and I met back in 1984 when he was fresh out of the master's program at the University of Toronto. And I was fortunate that at the time he chose to accept an appointment in my group at the Bank of Canada. And I know later I helped influence his decision to go back to school. Uh, it's about three years after, uh, after he joined the bank for his PhD. And actually in helping him to choose Western, and by Western I'm afraid I don't mean Western, but rather Western. This is a West, University of Western Ontario tie. 
um, which is now called Western University, believe it or not, quite ironically, I think, uh, that he would end up uh, teaching here at Western uh, Washington University, uh, having been educated at Western University. Um, but while he was there at Western, uh, my Western, uh, I was able to visit him from time to time. I always volunteered to do the on-campus recruitment trip uh, so that I could visit him and Tina, and it was a pleasure watching him grow through that period. Words you've used to describe Paul include sincere, uh, dedicated, thoughtful, and my favorite one is skeptical. Uh, but most importantly, just a really nice person, highly likable and a joy to work with. Now, of course, it never seems fair when we lose someone like Paul, uh, but to me, this is especially so, because after he came to Bellingham, we barely managed to stay in touch, very long distance, and, and we, we had emails from time to time and a beer and dinner if he came uh, up to Ottawa, which the, Tina and Paul did come uh, uh, every couple of years or so for, under their Canada US program. It was always a joy to catch up, and I treasure those memories even more now, of course. So it's very touching for me to have been invited to, uh, to give this lecture in Paul's memory, and I wanted badly to do something that, that Paul would have appreciated. And the good news is that Paul had very wide-ranging research interests, so I had lots to choose from. Uh, but he'd clearly settled on to Canada-U.S. relations, particularly trade issues, as a core interest. And his first full-time job was in monetary policy. So today I've chosen to explore an issue that he cared about deeply, cross-border trade integration, and to do that through the lens of a monetary policy practitioner. So let me just offer a quick sketch of my narrative before we go into the detail. So Paul had a strong interest in whether trade liberalization of the Canada-US free trade agreement or the later the move to NAFTA had actually led to increased integration in our two economies. And his work, often with Steve Goldberman, uh, finds very little definitive evidence of increased integration uh, of the Canada-US economies in the wake of either of those trade agreements. And this seems to be the case, whether you investigate trade flows, which is the most obvious thing, but investment flows, labor mobility, convergence in prices or factor input prices. So at the same time, though, some of their findings suggest that the issue might be just a little too complex and the demands on the data too great uh, to support that sort of rigorous empirical inference. In particular, there are some large shifts in trade patterns at the sectoral level which is suggestive of increased specialization and more trade in components. In short, supply chaining, call that. And as Goldberman and Storer themselves observe, periodic large and lasting fluctuations in the Canada-US exchange rate, combined with a degree of domestic price stickiness, are likely to pose challenges for empirical work around integration. So I'll be building on some of those observations and argue that there is more albeit soft evidence of increased trade integration, when the definition of trade is broadened to embrace all the dimensions of international business. So this includes widespread supply chaining and the establishment of foreign affiliates selling directly to uh, host markets or third markets. In other words, globalization in its uh, more various forms. And in fact, I think it's important not to restrict attention to the three NAFTA partner countries because additional countries, in particular China, may be important facilitators of integration within North America, like a triangle of trade. Now, statistical agencies are still catching up to these business trends, so I think by necessity, much of the evidence we'll bring to this matter is indirect. And today, I won't make any rigorous empirical claims, especially related to the effects of specific trade agreements, but it will suggest that the evidence of increased integration is sufficient for a monetary policy to take it seriously. So this issue intersects with monetary policy in at least two dimensions. The first is that monetary policy formulation depends heavily on empirical economic models. And the evolution of international business is for sure going to have consequences for model structure and for key model parameters. So for instance, domestic inflation may come to be driven more by global demand and global supply and less by purely domestic forces. 
as well the effects of fluctuations in domestic interest rates and exchange rates on the domestic economy may diminish as economies become more integrated across borders. And the second dimension relates to the strategy around monetary policy. That means what targets do you choose and how do you pursue them? The choice of target, how quickly to get back to target if you're thrown off target. In attempting to smooth real economic fluctuations with the goal of an inflation target, the central bank, of course, creates interest rate and exchange rate fluctuations. Now, these fluctuations may need to be bigger in a world where increased cross-border integration has weakened some of the key macroeconomic linkages the central banks rely on. And these shifting trade-offs need to be well understood in order to frame appropriate policy choices. So we'll explore those policy issues towards the end using a state-of-the-art macro model of the Canadian economy. Now, for your interest, my paper is being published on the Bank of Canada website right now. So we're going to start by reviewing some of the macro data just to, uh, to paint a picture. And I start with a concept that I call trade penetration. Some people call it trade intensity. It's a useful proxy for the importance of international trade for the domestic economy since it goes beyond the traditional concept of exports. So we use a country's nominal exports plus its imports as a share of nominal GDP to measure the importance or the penetration of trade in a domestic value creation. So in a globalized world, production processes are often geographically fragmented. And the competitiveness of a country's exports depends increasingly on inputs that come from somewhere else. So that facilitates the division of labor between lower wage and higher wage workers across the components that go into a, a given product. Now importantly, this fragmentation of our products boosts international trade, cross-border movement of, of stuff, parts, for a given level of GDP. So it looks like there's more trade per dollar of, of GDP. In fact, we trade the parts, and then after we're done trading the parts and they're put together, we trade the final products so those parts have moved again. So let's see how this will look at that. Everything's in order. So this is a chart showing the evolution of these trade penetration measures for Canada, the US, and Mexico. And, and a dotted line, well, the solid line, black line is for the whole world. And uh, the dotted line is just for advanced economies, not really different. So at the global level, you can see that trade penetration rose steadily from the early 1990s through to the collapse in trade that occurred after the global financial crisis in 07, 08. Um, there was a recovery in trade penetration after the global recession, but since 2010, total trade has been pretty flat, uh, even declining a little uh, in relative to global GDP. Now this weakness in global trade growth in the last few years has attracted quite a bit of attention the first, globalization has happened in waves, and you can't expect these waves to be repeated. Technological improvements have also played a role, falling tariffs and other costs, such as transportation and logistical support costs. So these things don't necessarily happen over and over. They happen once. Uh, global value chains, or I'll, call, I'll say GVC a few times today, GVCs, uh, those de the development GVC has received a major boost in all countries when China joined the WTO. Well, that can only happen once. Secondly, subdued business investment. Okay, that's, that's something we observe today. That's because, uh, we believe anyway, most of the, the post-crisis anxiety or uncertainty is slowing investment spending globally. And investment spending is a very trade-intensive activity. Those capital goods are moving all over the place, and they have parts that are produced in multiple countries. So soft investment in the world is having a disproportionate effect on the level of trade relative to global GDP. A third factor that plays here is that emerging markets, emerging markets generally have lower import elasticities than major economies. So as emerging markets get bigger as a share of the total, which obviously is occurring, what that means is that, the, that, that as that relative contribution goes up, the global income elasticity of trade has been declining. So for those reasons, it's maybe reasonable to expect global trade to pick up as the world economy continues to heal, 
but it seems unlikely that we'll have that same sort of rising trade penetration that we had during these waves in the past. And therefore, the ratio of trade to global GDP may not go up nearly as fast as we saw uh, during those, uh, those 20 years there. Now, this global pattern, as you can see, is perfectly mimicked by the U.S. economy. Canada and Mexico, though, within NAFTA have had a different experiences. So Mexico, which is uh, the green line, has seen a steady rise in trade penetration for over 30 years, and a huge acceleration that took place after NAFTA in 1994. So that's, uh, that's a pretty impressive uh, performance. Now, there's a little minor decline there in the wake of the financial crisis, but the uptrend resumed almost right away. Canada, quite a different chart. No rise in trade penetration after the Canada-US free trade agreement. Indeed, trade penetration was in a bit of a downtrend at the time. But then we saw a rapid rise during the 1990s. Now, NAFTA, 1994, may have made a contribution to that. We won't make a specific claim there. But the fact that much of the 1990s increase in trade penetration was later unwound during the, the 2000s suggests that there are other factors at work. One factor that we've identified was the global telecom boom and then the bust. Uh, certain Canadian companies were heavily involved in that, uh, in that boom and the bust, and so that was a very trade-intensive business. Another, uh, which is maybe even more obvious, was the steady appreciation of the Canadian dollar from 2002 to up till the financial crisis. So it went from, uh, you know, sort of 67 cents to, you know, eventually it ended up being above parity. So it's like on the order of a 50 percent rise in, in the exchange rate uh, of the Canadian dollar. And a persistent strength in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Uh, and the resilience of that uh, exchange rate was primarily due to high oil prices. And that led to considerable restructuring in many export sectors, including automobiles, forestry products, and the outli outright exit of large numbers of exporting companies, something like 10,000 companies in Canada disappeared during that phase of, of Canadian dollar strength. So obviously there are other things at work for the Canadian line. The U.S. business cycle was a contributor um, and other things, but importantly to us at least that in the last two to three years, a modest uptrend in trade penetration has uh, begun to uh, reemerge. So by this simple measure, it's a very simple measure of importance of trade, uh, we'd have to conclude that the three NAFTA countries have become more integrated with the global economy during the past 30 years, and that's especially the case uh, for Mexico. Now, the implications of those trends for goods exporting in the three NAFTA economies are illustrated here. Uh, so what you can see then is exports as a share of GDP have almost doubled in the United States in the past 30 years. I know it's kind of a, a shallow line, but it has doubled, and that's, those are big numbers, so it matters quite a lot. But showing that weakness we talked about earlier, the softness in trade towards the end. Mexico, spectacular uh, uptrend there, persistent uh, export to GDP ratio now approaching 35%. Uh, a very big uh, contributor to uh, Mexican uh, improvements. Uh, and in contrast, the export sector trauma of the 2000s in Canada shows up very clearly in this chart. We were as high as 37 percent of GDP up at the peak and now in the mid-20s, albeit, as I said, a bit of a, an upturn seemingly uh, showing up for us in the last uh, little while. Now, the concept of total trade penetration uh, embodies this idea that countries trade not just in final goods, uh, but in the components that go into them. This is, in effect, is the essence of the benefits of globalization. So a given product gets fragmented into its components. Some of them require highly skilled, highly paid workers, and some of them can be mass produced at low cost in lower wage locations. And trade then connects those fragments together into, into GVCs, permits a better matching, therefore, between skills and products, and therefore the overall costs are lower and higher productivity uh, results. So GVCs obviously boost conventional trade statistics for a given unit of GDP, and it makes it harder to interpret uh, these, uh, uh, these data points. 
So to, to dig, dig into that, we take a look here at global trade in intermediate goods. Intermediate goods, of course, are, are you know, the components that I'm talking about. Consumers aren't very interested in intermediate goods. They're only interested in the finished product. So this is business to business trade and fundamentally productivity enhancing. So an uptrend in these data points is a very positive sign for an economy. So this chart shows that uh, intermediate goods uh, trade for all three countries uh, has, been, has been growing steadily. And while they've all seen it since NAFTA, the large acceleration after 2000 suggests that something bigger was going on, not just NAFTA. So again, this is where I think the bigger influence was China's accession to the WTO, uh, in an effect creating a triangular trade relationship with China, facilitating growth and trade here by being a superb producer of the mass-created mass uh, uh, bits and pieces. So the level of intermediate goods trade for the U.S., though, dwarfs that for Canada and Mexico by a factor of about four for, Can for Canada and by seven uh, for Mexico. So the importance of intermediate goods trade to the U.S. economy, much more important than for other economies, is consistent with the U.S. role as a global hub for multinational enterprises, MNEs. They're the ones that develop those GVCs that span multiple countries including the NAFTA partners, but other countries. Now, it would be very difficult to disentangle all these data, uh, but they are at least consistent with a rising degree of North American integration over the past uh, 20 years. Now, it's worth observing that supply chain trade often happens within the same firm. This is actually a really important point. The trade facilitated version of vertical integration, the old days companies built themselves and, and would include their parts suppliers in that vertically integrated firm, like General Motors, let's say, you know, in where I grew up in Oshawa. So you'd have all the parts producers right there in Oshawa and they'd produce all the bits that go into the plant and the plant would build a car. Uh, so the M&E creates or purchases the entities, though. Today, those entities are scattered in the way I described. The fragmentation is geographic. Uh, they don't have to be nearly as close by. The M&E, though, still creates that vertically integrated uh, structure by either creating or purchasing those entities that are supplying it. That increases reliability, quality control, efficiency, and, of course, in internalizes the value added and the profitability associated with that that lies in the supply chain. So these are very clear in the manufacturing sector of the NAFTA countries. So some data points here. For the U.S., some 40% of manufactured exports to Canada are intra-firm. So it's a U.S. company exporting to itself from the U.S. to Canada. And about 50% of U.S. imports from Canada are within the same firm. That's a pretty big number. So what about U.S.-Mexico? Well, pretty similar, 40% of U.S. manufactured exports to Mexico are within the same firm. And 70% of U.S. imports from Mexico are intra-firm trade, so they're within the same firm. These data point to a very high level of cross-border integration. Even if it's within the same firm, well, that's what optimization is all about. It's very clear in certain manufacturing sectors like automobiles, aerospace, and telecom equipment. But there are lots of other examples. So as noted earlier, trade through a value chain creates a certain amount of double counting. We should probably call it multi-counting of trade flows because the same items cross borders more than once. Um, another, an example that I'm familiar with was uh, BlackBerry BlackBerry pieces were being uh, created in seven different countries, and each supplier they had more than they, each supplier was replicated somewhere else in case the supply chain got disrupted. So they had two global value chains uh, for uh, for assurance uh, that they, they would never run out or there'd be a disruption. So those pieces were floating back and forth across borders, and then final assembly, and then of course those units were sold all over the place. So a mobile phone designed and engineered in one country, assembled in another country, components produced in six or six or eight other countries, sold to the entire world. That's a lot of trade for one thing that costs a couple hundred dollars. 
Uh, so a lot of trade per dollar of GDP. Um, so what this means is that any change in the structure of global value chains can either inflate or, the reverse, depress what we call normal trade flows. So uh, the OECD has been doing some work to try and uh, nail down some of this. Uh, they've developed indicators of trade in value added. And so uh, the same process that statisticians use uh, to create a GDP statistic for us, it's the value added at each stage. If you bring an input out from, from outside, well, that's not counted as you didn't create it here. Okay, so that gets deducted, if you like, and then it gets incorporated in the next thing, and the next stage of the process has value added, and then you end up with the final, uh, the final product. So and that's why GST or VAT is charged only on the value added, the VAT, uh, is charged only on the part that, that you add here. So, so the OECD has developed these indicators of trade and value added terms, and it attempts to capture the value added in each country's participation in the value chain. So viewed from the domestic lens, building a global value chain means outsourcing the content of the final product, therefore reducing its domestic content. And the OECD is showing us here that 45, I haven't shown every country, but 45 out of the 61 economies that they study have seen a significant decline in the domestic content of their exports over the last 20 years. And that's what you see going from a blue line, a blue bar, which is... Uh, I forgot the dates, uh, I can't see it from here. 95 versus 2011, so close enough to 20 years. Um, and so uh, almost every case, you've got blue going down to red, blue going down to red. Um, and so uh, this includes Mexico, of course. Um, you can see there quite a, quite a, a, a big one there. Um, of course, and in, in particular, the Macadores along the Mexico-U.S. border are playing a big role in that. And that's, of course, a lot of intra-firm activity, as I mentioned earlier. Um, now, these observations fit that hypothesis of increased integration across a large number of economies, but a couple of exceptions worth noting. One, of course, is Canada. Uh, there's been a modest increase, as you can see there, in the domestic value added to total exports, which kind of runs at odds with uh, the hypothesis. But the reason for this is that Canada's growth engine during much of this period uh, was in the commodity sector, primarily oil. And this, of course, by definition pretty well, is primarily a domestic value added uh, business. Um, if we take a look at the next chart, uh, which only goes with manufacturing sector uh, statistics. So from Canada's manufacturing sector, we clearly see the predicted decline in domestic uh, value added uh, through the manufacturing uh, value chains. Uh, and that, I think, uh, captures well this globalization trend. Now, the other interesting exception uh, is China, uh, which uh, has been by far the biggest recipient of global value chain business, very labor-intensive forms. And what that means, of course, is the explosion of global trade in the wake of China's accession to the WTO has contained a large share of Chinese domestic value added. Uh, over time, though, China has been creeping up the value added chain, particularly in manufacturing. And you can see that in, in this, in this uh, chart here. So we're kind of walking through these data points to see how much uh, support or, or how, many, how much contrary evidence there might be around this uh, integration hypothesis. So, Another indicator that's not often looked at is the rising cross-border integration through the use of foreign affiliates, foreign affiliates uh, facilitating trade. Now, a domestic company has a choice of producing here at home, shipping abroad, or, of course, it could locate abroad and ship directly to that host country, and from there, perhaps, to other third countries. And we see all of these arrangements. Either arrangement can be supported by a global value chain which crosses other borders. Now, both, both the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and NAFTA liberalized and offered legal protection of cross-border investment. So to understand the effects of these agreements, we need to look beyond cross-border flows of goods and services. So data on the operations of foreign affiliates with domestic majority ownership are a little harder to come by. And actually, they're reported, but with a substantial lag. So the latest data that we have right now, uh, for Canada anyway, is 2013. But in 2013, sales by Canadian-owned 
foreign affiliates operating abroad almost matched the total amount of exports sold directly from Canada. So we had $510 billion worth of sales by Canadian-owned entities operating in other countries in 2013, and we had $573 billion in exports from Canada that same year. So very similar uh, magnitude. There's almost as big a uh, Canadian economy operating in foreign countries as there is within Canada in the domestic export sector. And those entities, of course, create jobs and GDP both in Canada and abroad. Now, Canadian-owned affiliates operating in the U.S. account for about half of this uh, foreign affiliate business and actually employ about 600,000 people in the United States. Now, they employ people, of course, in Canada, too. Harder to get to nail down because they, they employ Canadian people, but you don't know, are they servicing the foreign entity or are they servicing the domestic entity? It's harder to separate out. Now, Canadian operations in Mexico generate sales of about $15 billion a year, and they employ about 70,000 people in, in Mexico. And again, as I said, so figuring out how many Canadians are working in Canada to support those businesses is harder to do, but it's big. So an example would be uh, a chartered bank uh, with a big foreign business has, you know, towers full of lawyers, accountants, and others that do the, that service that foreign business. And those high quality jobs simply wouldn't exist if that bank didn't have a foreign business to, to run. So importantly, the corresponding U.S. figures, foreign affiliate uh, international business, are an order of magnitude greater. So U.S. affiliates operating abroad generate annual sales on the order of $6 trillion, with over $600 billion of that taking place in Canada and $200 billion of that happening in Mexico. I hope you'll agree that these are very large numbers. I mean, at a minimum, they imply that standard export and import data provide only a very partial picture of what international business looks like today. International business is much more complex today. And the simple analysis that I started with of you know, trade flows really just scratches the surface of that. So that, those observations are not definitively, but to me they collectively support the view that cross-border integration has increased in North America over the past 20 years. Now, as I said at the beginning, deeper structural evidence of increased integration is much harder to come by. And that's, of course, what, as economists, that's what we really want. You know, we want the, the model to throw out the result and you got the, uh, the specific evidence. Um, this is probably the case, though, because the effects of trade agreements are highly sector-specific. Often they're even firm-specific. And there's always lots of other forces that are acting at the same time to affect macro statistics hard to control for in the empirical tests. For example, some sectors may have been more protected than others before a trade agreement. So you get outsized adjustments that may be masked in the aggregate data. Shifts in industry composition or in factor intensity can easily distort microphenomena when aggregated into macro statistics. And there may be subsequent shocks that hit particular industries and mess up those tests. Well, the literature has built up a number of insights over the years on the effects of specific trade agreements. I won't walk through that literature today. There are a number of key references in my paper, so I'll, I'll refer you to that. Um, but just to say that taking it all together, it's, it's, if, if it's not fully convincing, it is at least highly suggestive. The broad brush review of the data points that shown here, along with the literature on the more specific structural evidence, to me, at least, passes the minimal test, which is that enough evidence that cross-border trade integration has increased over the last 20 years that we should trade it seriously. Of course, it remains possible to be skeptical of the depth of this hypothesis, especially if you're trying to credit either the free trade agreement, Canada-US, or NAFTA specifically with observed results in the trade data. That content uh, is, is, seems a little hard to, uh, to bring to the surface. And for sure, the impact of the two agreements on trade seems to have fallen short of the predictions that we saw before those trade agreements. That much is for sure. Uh, 
Um, and some would even point to evidence in the last few years of what I would call integration reversals, or a popular term for it is reshoring. Uh, so if things are being reshored, then obviously things are unraveling in the sense that we're describing. You know, it's a deglobalization de of some kind. But to me, it's important to keep those anecdotes in, uh, in perspective. The fact is that globalization was never likely to take us to some idyllic end state of pure integration. There's a lot of realities that intrude on that. Now, these realities would include First, the limited availability of trade finance for companies operating in many smaller countries. Secondly, the cost of building and maintaining global logistics networks. It's not free. Geopolitical risks are a big one. And I mentioned, you know, the example of BlackBerry having two distinct geographic suppliers for every component for exactly these kinds of disruptive uh, reasons. And natural risk, you know, like so there's a there's bad weather or there's uh, an earthquake or something like this that disrupts the supply chain. Um, so the preference also to have suppliers closer to buyers. So some companies tried it long distance and they didn't find it as reliable as having suppliers closer by. So that gave rise to some re-equilibration or reshoring. And importantly, and we almost never think of this uh, as economists, I think, is after sales service and maintenance for for complex equipment. Uh, that's hard to do from long distance. Um, and so just, just a few uh, reasons why it was a, never the case that everything would get globalized, everything would get offshored. Um, and most importantly, of course, the trend towards factor equalization, not proven, of course, but it's easy to see rising wages in China and in Mexico. Well, that, what that does is every few years, a company must reevaluate whether they have the optimal supply chain. Uh, and so they have opportunities to do so every time they're considering an expansion of their capacity. Uh, when they do that, they can re-optimize and say, you know, let's do that next step of expansion right here at home because it makes more sense to us today than it did five years ago, the last time we reviewed this uh, problem. So uh, having that uh, sort of, if you like, dynamic or constant uh, ebb and flow um, is probably the better way to think of the state of globalization. And it means that the degree of integration can vary significantly over time, both directions. And it makes it very risky to treat it as some sort of state of the world that's subject to empirical verification. It happened, there it is, I can prove it, because it, it may, it may uh, unwind. My overall reading is that the evidence of increased international integration is easily sufficiently compelling for a policymaker like me to take it seriously, since it may affect how our models work and how our decision making uh, is impacted by that. So our next question is, how does increased integration affect monetary policy transmission? So it's easiest to think about this in the context of a textbook open economy model with inflation driven by a Phillips curve and with the central bank targeting inflation. In this framework, a macroeconomic shock moves projected inflation off target, not actual. Right? So projected inflation goes off target and the central bank then has some time to adjust interest rates in a manner that brings inflation back to its target and the usual rule of thumb is in the sort of six to eight quarter kind of range. So for ease of exposition, assume a negative shock to foreign demand, okay? Some foreign economy, like in Canada's case, the United States has a slowdown, let's say. And that prompts the central bank, Canada, to cut interest rates to keep inflation on target. So that interest rate response that the central bank works uh, mainly through intertemporal substitution by both consumers and firms. They borrow more because of lower interest rate. They spend it on goods, housing, investments. Meanwhile, the cut in interest rates is associated with some depreciation of the domestic currency. Sometimes hard, actually very hard to predict, but on average it tends to depreciate. And that has a separate channel which boosts exports and dampens imports. And that broadens that policy effect on aggregate demand. That depreciation of the exchange rate would normally boost domestic inflation temporarily, right? So now it's getting much more complicated. That's why we need models. But the increase in domestic aggregate demand through all these other effects combined with these 
uh, the, the shock offsets that drop in foreign demand, and after the temporary effects run out of inflation, we get back to target. So this mechanism relies on two key reduced foreign parameters, the interest elasticity of aggregate demand and the exchange rate elasticity of aggregate demand. So the issue for us to consider is how the evolution of international trade, as we've discussed earlier, may have influenced those parameters, either directly or through more subtle, deeper changes in the underlying structure of the economy. The ultimate effects on inflation will depend on the interaction between that domestic output gap, how much excess capacity do we have, and domestic inflation. So just to illustrate this, let's compare a world in which entire products are produced in individual countries and exported to others with one that's integrated or globalized, it's dominated by M&Es with suppliers scattered all around the world. Well, the investment decision of an M&E will be driven more by global variables. That's pretty obvious, right? It's going to be driven by global variables, not so much by the domestic variables where they're situated. So it would include interest rate fluctuations, for sure. If the M&E has access to global capital markets, its decision-making may be much less influenced by domestic interest rates, uh, much more by global interest rates. Now, that sounds reasonable, but there's very little empirical evidence for or against that as a conjecture. So I've set it aside for today. But the second one is the fluctuation in individual exchange rate. Now that may have a more muted effect on an M&E because, of course, in a globalized world, the M&E is built across several uh, geographic frontiers. So when one exchange rate goes up, another one goes down, you kind of have this thing that may influence the chain in some way, but a kind of a wash. And uh, many companies would say that to me, you know, as a, as a global M&E, we don't really pay much attention to exchange rates except when we make big strategic decisions. But day by day, it's all washed up because we are the world. You know, that's the kind of notion that you have in mind there. So uh, the third thing uh, is that building a GVC generally means increasing the degree of specialization in production. So, you know, if you used to make the things all in your plant and then you create a GVC, what you're doing is choosing a plant in Thailand somewhere or China to make this component. And back home, the things that happen there are more specialized too because they're no longer the generalists doing everything. So you get an increased specialization at each point in the supply chain once it's optimized. Now this specialization presumably reduces the substitutability of producers across countries because okay, we need that component for most people. So that gives you a second structural reason why the exchange rate may have less of an effect on trade flows because we've already decided who's going to produce that thing and they're specialized in it. And so the exchange rate movement may be regrettable, uh, but it can't really change the structure. So there's actually a wide range of empirical literature supporting these conjectures. And, and given that, it's not surprising to find that globalization has generally made domestic inflation more sensitive to global demand and less sensitive to domestic disturbances. This is documented, for example, the, at the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, which is our the central bank for central banks, where we we come together a few times a year to, to trade notes on these things. So in other words, the global output gap may become the most important determinant of domestic inflation. Another structural channel to consider, uh, which many people talk about in trade, is the, the linkage between cross-border integration and income distribution. Now, it's generally understood that increased trade penetration and specialization leads to offshoring of labor-intensive, lower productivity fragments. Well, that leads to higher average productivity levels in the domestic economy and higher incomes domestically. But it may also lead to an increase in domestic income dispersion. Okay, a widely observed stylized fact for the past 20 years, especially discussed here in the United States. Now, obviously, it varies a lot from one country to another. The implications of trade liberalization for a given country depend on what other policies may be implemented in a country, whether the, at the same time or subsequently. And income distribution outcomes that are sometimes attributed to globalization turn out to be driven by other things like technological change. Well, this chart shows a one summary income distribution statistic. That's the ratio of income share of the top 10% of the population 
to the bottom 10 percent for the three NAFTA countries. And all three of these showed an increase in income dispersion during the 1990s. Now, this trend has continued into the 2000s for the U.S., but it's been partly reversed in Canada and quite largely reversed in Mexico. Now, of course, since other elements of the policy architecture that affect income distribution have not remained constant through this period, we can make no claim that these patterns are driven by trade. Shifts in income distribution, though, could have implications for standard models that economists use. In particular, those in the low-income part of the scale may have less access to credit. Therefore, low-income groups may be more likely to be credit constrained. What that means is that interest rate fluctuations don't really affect them. Similarly, high-income groups basically make their spending plans anywhere they want, and fluctuations in interest rates may not affect their decisions either. So if you've increased income dispersion, you may actually be decreasing the interest rate sensitivity of the economy in the way I surmised before. So again, there's limited empirical evidence of this, but to me, we have very limited empirical evidence of the strength of the interest rate elasticity of the economy anyway. So it's hard to prove a distinct uh, hypothesis like this. So in principle, though, the interest elasticity is made up of a whole spectrum of actors, not just a single agent like we think of when we write down these models. So the underlying heterogeneity could be large or small, but to me, it's something that we need to take a look at. So what we have here is a series of conjectures about how rising trade integration might be affecting standard policy models. So now we're going to take a quick look at the Bank of Canada's macroeconomic model. It's called TOTEM, and it stands for Terms of Trade Economic Model. It's a large-scale, multi-sector DSGE model that captures the consensus macroeconomic link linkages in the Canadian economy. And it has sufficient detail in it to allow us to illustrate this, the range of possible interactions between cross-border integration and monetary policy, including separate modeling of commodity and non-commodity export sectors, the production of domestic goods and services, and consumption behavior with two groups of consumers, credit constrained and not credit constrained. So all of those things are in the model and uh, so we can, we can test them. So to study the effects of rising cross-border integration, we compare a base version of our model with a version featuring five changes to the model structure. And these changes attach to the, uh, the, the, uh, the conjectures that I raised before. So a lower exchange rate elasticity of uh, non-commodity exports, a higher share of imported inputs, into the production of exports domestically because of GVCs. Third, a higher share of imported inputs into domestic production for domestic consumer goods, also GVCs. A lower elasticity of substitution between domestic inputs and imported inputs. That's the specialization point I made before. And fifth, a higher share of credit constrained consumers. So we subject these two versions of the model to the same series of exogenous shocks and compare the responses. And throughout, in both versions, monetary policy is guided by maintaining the inflation target. So our conjecture is that increased integration will make the economy less responsive to both interest rate and exchange rate fluctuations and make inflation targeting harder to do. So in both, both versions of the model, the central bank is equally successful in offsetting uh, shocks relative to inflation. So what we compare are the variability of interest rates, exchange rates, and the output gap, the actual real cycle of the economy. In chart seven, I offer up the two versions of the model responding to a negative shock in the foreign economy. So you could think of this as there's a recession in the United States, and Canada feels it, and the central bank has to respond. And what you see up there is uh, uh, the GDP track, so that's the, uh, the red line is the less trade integrated, and the blue line is the more trade integrated. So you see the inflation chart, they're almost identical. The central bank responds to the same signals and tries to do them. Uh, but what you see is a much bigger cycle in the domestic economy in the integrated trade case. And much harder, the central bank is trying harder by cutting rates further, and the exchange rate depreciates quite a bit more. Uh, under the uh, trade integrated. So that fits the intuition that we, uh, that we laid out before. 
So those conjectures seem to be borne out uh, in, in, uh, in this uh, one case. Um, now the, uh, basically these are, this is only a specific shock, so uh, what we do uh, to, to elaborate more on this, uh, in fact, this, these conjectures that are laid out are very aligned and these results uh, are aligned with what Woodford showed in his 2007 peer, uh, paper. It makes it harder for central banks to stabilize the economy when there's a lot of integration. Now, I'm going to move next to what, what, we, what, we, what we do is use the model to, to generate macroeconomic data by running the same history of economic shocks through them. And then we can ca compare the relative variances uh, uh, to the two different kinds, two different versions of the model. And so what we'll see here is that uh, we have about 29 percent increase in variability of the economy. The output gap is, is measured here. So you'd, you know, the unemployment rate and so on would be some 29 percent more variable in the highly integrated case, 10 percent more interest rate variability, and, and over 30 percent increase in exchange rate variability with the central bank achieving the same goal. So in other words, in order to get the job done, we have to do more work. So that, that of course, uh, again, fits our intuition. So uh, what we did then was we decomposed those effects across the five changes that I introduced to the model. And there you have the five changes are listed at the bottom. And then, of course, they're across the top, okay? So what we do there then is to say they have to add up to 100%. So uh, what you can see, see there is the reduction in the exchange rate elasticity of export demand uh, plays a very important role in, in generating these higher variances, both interest rates, exchange rates, and the output gap. Comparatively speaking, the share of imported inputs in domestic or, or uh, export production has only a modest effect on the variability of the, var of the variables that we care about. Um, if we look at income dispersion, which is uh, change number five, uh, it's modeled quite crudely here. It's not really, it's not, there's not much uh, detail in the model to be able to do this. It's rather a crude proxy. It has a primary effect, makes the interest elasticity of the economy less, and so you get more variability in all the variables because the, the monetary authority has to work much harder to get it done. This one, of course, is, uh, is one of our softer outcomes since we haven't really modeled income dispersion very well in the model. It's more of an illustrative case. Interestingly, the relative variances uh, generated by totem offer trade-offs that could be considered strategically. So you could re reduce these relative variances by introducing other policies into the model, such as stronger automatic fiscal stabilizers. Okay, so the monetary policy doesn't have to do as much of the work. In other words, a better mix of fiscal monetary policy. Or macroprudential policies, okay, which uh, is all, all de rigueur these days. Alternatively, the central bank could allow more flexibility in inflation so that it would have less variability in the other things. And that's an argument for having a wider target range for the central bank. Uh, after all, if inflation is 2 versus 2.5, do people really care, or if it's 1.5? So you, that volatility um, may be instrumental in reducing the amount of variability we see in other variables, which, of course, uh, are not all desirable. So those trade-offs would be very difficult to formalize ex ante, but could be considered within a risk management problem that the central bank faces, which is, given what we face today, what are the risks of variability that we're seeing and what's the most important thing to us? So let me conclude. Now, it's an article of faith among most economists that trade liberalization will lead firms and households to re-optimize their behavior. It will manifest itself in increased integration of economies. The aggregate economic gains from such a shift, I think, are widely recognized, acknowledged by most as are the potential effects on income distribution. But the real world is really complex. So many things are not being held constant. Proving such conjectures empirically can be very difficult. And my good friend Paul held that, held that faith, but he wore his skepticism like a comfortable suit, and for a number of good reasons. And I've argued here that seeking rigorous and empirical proof may be too much of a burden for the data to bear. But if we take a broader lens to international business activity, what we see is highly suggestive. 
that trade liberalization has increased integration within NAFTA, and that constitutes sufficient evidence for a policymaker like me to take it seriously. And we conjecture that rising integration will mean parameter bias or possibly structural misspecification in workhorse models that policymakers routinely use. Ultimately, of course, policy models can be revised to capture these evolutions of behavior. And I can tell you that the version of TOTEM that we use every day includes most of the changes that we've introduced here. So they're already there because integration is a, is a reality in, in the Canadian economy. Um, so we actually had to construct the pre-integration version of the model and, and the shocks uh, introduced uh, in that way. So the point, though, as I made before, that that degree of integration may not be constant through time. And so it's a very important to keep that as a variable in uh, evaluating uh, structural change in the economy. Now, for the present, to me, it may have to suffice for policymakers to acknowledge these risks and consider how to insulate policy outcomes from those risks. Our simulations suggest that, uh, that models that don't recognize rising integration will probably predict that monetary policy actions will be more effective at stabilizing the economy and controlling inflation than they will in practice. In other words, a central bank that relies on a model that does not take rising trade integration into account when it should will tend to react too gradually and perhaps insufficiently to those shocks. That would run the risk of inflation deviating from target for longer than desired. But on the other side of this is a bit of comfort. By all accounts, it would appear that trade integration is not headed for infinity. That optimal level of cross-border integration is a complex decision by companies. And as such, we have every reason to believe that that bias in, that globalization may be bringing into our models, that evolves gradually and can evolve in both directions, it has natural limits. But policymakers need to acknowledge that international developments will have a, an influence, possibly a growing one, on their economies and on the volatility of their financial markets. I want to thank you very much. I have a question if you go back to your first or second slide on values added in the domestic sectors of, of uh, half a dozen different countries. Yep. Now, my yeah. friend Richard and I were looking at that and comparing Japan and China, okay. and it's almost unbelievable that the value added, the domestic value added, is low. Because the popular opinion is the domestic uh, value added is cheap labor, yeah. right? It should be huge. Well, is the reason it's so low is that labor is paid so badly in China and that the bulk of the value added in exports is in imported inputs of, of various kinds? Or is it imported labor intensive inputs? Or is it in imported capital intensive right. imports? Uh, because. Uh, you know, if, if you had asked me that question outright, I would have reversed the Japanese bars with the Chinese bars. Huh. It doesn't make intuitive sense to me. Okay. Well, it's, it all depends on what it is you're exporting, I think. Uh, so in China's case, they're, uh, uh, what, they're, what they're exporting are low value, low wage rates, low tech bits and pieces, which... Uh, which we need to throw into our, our products wherever the final assembly takes place. Um, in Japan's case, it's become, uh, it's, it's basically offshore all of that stuff long ago and only does high value things. Um, and so even in cars, the less expensive cars they produce somewhere else and the high, very expensive cars they still do. Uh, again, with parts that are, that are largely offshore. So, 
Yeah, I think it's I think it's all that, and we expect to see China to as it's climbing this value-added ladder, it's going to go up a lot. And I think part of the slowdown that we're seeing in global trade is that underlying phenomenon that they're they're internalizing more. Is the simple answer that the value-added is in low-cost labor? Yes, uh, that's why versus, we do it. Versus the value-added being in high-cost capital-intensive, uh, yes, you know, intelligence-intensive. Uh, so if we're making a product that requires, you know, uh, uh, you know, regular workers and, and skilled trades people and Jedi uh, to do, then we we offshore the lower end of that, and you know, China makes it, and it turns out to be, you know, one tenth of the value of the thing that we eventually sell, and the Jedi are still here designing and all that sort of thing, um, and uh, yeah, so. You know, some things in these data points are surprising, like, uh, so, for example, I learned that the value added of, of auto assembly is like 5 or 6 percent of the value of the car you buy. So, you know, the, the assembly plant that everybody re has to have, you know, for their, for their community and so on is very low value added. Uh, most of the value is in the parts and the subsystems that come in from the parts makers. And so in Canada, the parts system, the whole parts sector, has like more than doubled in size in the last 20 years, while the assembly sector has shrunk dramatically. And those suppliers have had to go global in order to survive that departure of assembly. So yes, I think it is as simple as that. China has uh, you know, got, had the low cost labor, so the stuff comes out as low, low on here. But that, that is going up quite rapidly now. So that chart is probably going to look uh, quite different in 10 years' time. Next question. Get my exercise. Jeremy's going to get his exercise today, isn't he? He's, uh, he's actually kind of slow, I think. <laughs> Somebody back there? Yeah. Uh, in in light of the increase the volatility in Brent pricing and how Alberta's proven bitumen reserves is on par with Saudi Arabia, how is uh, increased volatility in crude prices and the huge impact the oil and gas industry has on Canada's uh, economy influencing your uh, interest rate decisions and also that OPEC's fair capacity is at a decade low? Like if there was a black swan event, would that materially impact your decision? Yes. Next question. <laughs> uh, I was treating it seriously as that's a, a lecture, all right. Uh, so, but but it's true uh, for sure that Canada's uh, energy sector, really big part of our economy, much bigger than the, the similar uh, proportion for the United States. So uh, when prices collapsed, it fell by actually it fell by at least sixty percent. At one point, they were you know below thirty dollars a barrel. Uh, this was having an effect at, at the sort of $40 to $45 level. It's pulling about uh, $70 billion a year out of Canada's income. So to put it in U.S. terms, so we're talking a number like $700 billion worth of income being extracted from the economy. So the economy obviously must react to that. And so does the central bank. That what meant a, a significant uh, recession was on its way. Uh, we cut rates, you know, before we had the evidence of of the uh, of that recession, but it was easy to do the arithmetic around it because we had uh, one of the best models in the business to actually uh, simulate what would happen. And sure enough, we did have, uh, you know, a, 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 a retracement in the economy, but we cushioned the blow with two interest rate cuts. Uh, but th what's more important is it'll take three to five years for the economy to uh, restructure itself in response to that lower regime in prices. Um, and that'll mean growth in the non-energy sector and shrinkage in the energy sector. Same thing is happening in the United States, but because it's a smaller effect, you can say, oh, you know, investment is a bit slow. Well, that's because the energy sector is cutting investment while other sectors are still growing their investment. So it's like a drag on growth, whereas in Canada it's big enough to actually dominate the macro picture. Uh, so that'll take several years uh, for the economy to adjust to that. And so that is a, that is a one, I, that's why we built this model. Actually, nobody has, else has a fully developed uh, 
terms of trade structural model like what we have. And we did that because those shocks, the variability in, in energy prices and other commodities is a really important variable to us and it's just kind of a smaller variable for most other countries. Um, so it does play an, a key role in monetary policy formulation, absolutely. Yeah. So we just, just have the one mic, so we're, yeah. Fellow in the cap. There we go. So I have a question about, I think it was chart six, the income distribution. Yeah. So um, in terms of the highest 10%, the lowest 10%, I assume that means just the highest 10% or lowest 10% of income earners at any given year, any given time period? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, do you know roughly how often uh, people move between um, income brackets in, in Canada, and maybe compared to the United States? Um, no, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we, have, uh, we have a different tax system and a different education system. Some of the fundamental analyses, like, you know, if, you, if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with Piketty's book on income distribution. So uh, we have a different uh, fabric, if you like. So uh, we get uh, kind of a different uh, evolution of wealth through the economy, somewhat more spread around than what we see in the U.S. economy. Uh, but, but I don't know how, how quickly we move in and out of those things. I, I, I know the answer to that. It's, uh, in the U.S., it, uh, there's a 7.5% chance of moving from the bottom 10% to the top 10% of the income, 20%, I'm sorry, bottom 20 to top 20. Right, 7% chance with, of moving from bottom uh, to top. Intergenerationally, right. for the sun to move from the bottom yeah. to the top. And in Canada? In Canada, it's 16.5%. So it's about double. Yes. That fits my prior. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think primarily, it, uh, like the drivers that we've had mentioned was like the much lower cost for education in Canada uh, gives you, you know, a more widespread opportunity to make those kinds of moves. But I, they're probably a much more complex story than that, of course. Are you a Blue Jays fan? <laughs> Isn't everybody? Oh, okay. <laughs> The Jays are going to take it all again. Uh, Governor, uh, given your uh, uh, statements on integration and trade and so forth, what does a central bank have to do to manage the highs and lows of a business cycle now? Does it, uh, does it say that there is less inf ability to influence that, or, or, or does the status quo hold? Uh, no, I mean, what this, what this says is that it, it maybe explains a little bit about how um, when, when we have these global events, how long it takes us to get back to normal, right? So policy tools, there's many reasons why policy tools today are having smaller effects than they seem to have had in the past, and, and this may be just one small share of that. So I don't want to want you to get carried away with how much this uh, impacts that. Um, but what it tells you is that uh, there, are, there are, in that, that range of possible outcomes, there are trade-offs there which we maybe didn't understand very well before. So that increased integration means that we'll have to work a little harder to get where we want to go. But it doesn't change the fact that you're still going to do the work to get where we want to go. Uh, it just means you're looking at different things to calibrate what your responses need to be and conditioning those on, uh, on a different model set. So uh, it fundamentally doesn't uh, doesn't remove our job or make uh, central banking less relevant or anything like that. But, uh, but it does mean that uh, we have to have a stronger awareness of how those, those factors influence those decisions and incorporate them. And I characterize only briefly, there's, I've, I've got a paper uh, that's about risk management in monetary policy making. So that's, I, the, my preferred way to think of this is not as an engineering or mechanical exercise like we do in the, in the models. In the models we say, okay, let's tell the model to keep inflation on target with this much tolerance. And then the rest is just arithmetic that comes out of that complicated model. Well, in the real world, it's more like there's a zone of ignorance that we're not sure exactly where we are, and we're not really sure where we're going, but we have projections of that. And so there's a zone of uncertainty that we're not 
we're, we're operating within, and we're doing it in a forward-looking fashion because the things we do today won't affect things for six quarters, and so we have to know where we will be in six to eight quarters to be able to offset that and get us somewhere else, see? So a very complicated problem is not subject to that engineering kind of thing we do in models. So in the real world, what we do is we say, well, it looks like we're here, and it looks like we're going there, and is that okay? And if it looks okay, then we say, well, we're not going to change rates today, even though the model says, you know, if I did it this finely, you know, it would suggest this or that. Uh, so you just take it as, the, well, there's a slight upside or a slight downside risk to our, our trajectory, but it's within the zone of tolerance that we've set out for ourselves. And therefore, when you're in that, then you have somebody comes along and says, yeah, but wait, integration's gone up because we signed this trade agreement. And you're like, okay, and what effect would that have? Well, that would tilt our projection to the upside, let's say. Uh, and say, okay, I can tolerate upside risk in this situation. If they said, oh, it's downside risk, I'd say, well, that's not very welcome given where we start. You see the difference? So those things go into that risk set, and then those risks get managed, and it's not a precise mechanical exercise, whereas most, most of us as economists, we think of it that way, which is not, not correct. You've got a follow-up question. Yeah. I've confused you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, if, if, we're, if there's a higher level of uncertainty, does monetary policy then become more careful? Uh, you know, yeah. central banks, they've That's been a good very way cautious. To put it. it becomes more cautious. Uh, because if you're not sure where you are, then you, you see, like, if you don't know where you are or where you're going, it's best to kind of wait and see if it clarifies, right? Because obviously you're, you could end up just chasing your tail if, if, you know, and you have what we call instrument instability in models, which is you're, you're, you're reacting to something that's never going to happen. Uh, it's just noise. So once you acknowledge there is noise, then that does cause you to be more cautious in your uh, decision making, and um, yes, that inter introduces an additional risk, which is that you could be late. But given the un the unknowns, that's appropriate because you, as long as you're within your tolerance zone, then you've done the best thing you can do for policy and offset the the risks as they are. It also introduces asymmetry, which is if you're starting like where we are today with a long period of slow growth and we're watching for the upside surprise to finally show up. If something comes along that's negative, okay, so there's downside risk, that's much more important to us given where we start than if there was a symmetric upside risk. The risks usually aren't, you know, in models they're symmetric, but in the real world you go, okay, show me all the upside risk, man, because I'm ready for some of that. <laughs> Uh, because we've been a long time with revising down and being disappointed and all that. But if there's downside risk identified, given what you've been through, that's, you know, you're much more ready to react to that because you're already in a low part of that zone of, ex of tolerance that you've laid out. So. Well, we got one more question. One more question. Steve, you mentioned Paul had a wide range of interests. So uh, a couple of years ago here in Bellingham, he organized a, con or a, a session at a, a regional economics conference on secular stagnation. Oh, boy. Not exactly uh, the topic you're covering today, but do you have any thoughts on that, uh, that uh, widely talked about issue today? Uh, sure. I mean, I know it's, it's an active debate uh, on many fronts. I mean, we, we readily acknowledge that we have entered a slower growth phase in the world. Um, you know, we've had, we've had a trend line for 50 years. It's been a very strong trend line for the world, and that's because everybody experienced the post-war baby boom. And 50 years later, we're starting to go to an accelerated retirement cycle. And so everybody's labor force is slowing down. And anything that lasts 50 years sounds like forever, right? But nothing's, in demographic terms, truly nothing's forever. So we know that the world is, about, is going through a, a, a natural moderation because of the moderation of inputs, labor. And unless we have some significant uptick in productivity to offset it, well, and no one usually forecasts that. We could have one. We could discover something uh, next week that makes a big difference to that trend line. But right now, you don't assume it.
Okay, so this is, I, I, I certainly uh, don't think of that as stagnation. I call that slower growth, and on a per capita basis, it's still significant. And so like Japan may, being a case where they've had very low growth for a long time, but actually have a shrinking population. Well, the shrinking population, zero growth is a pretty good deal. You know, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be able to do better, which I think they can. The point is that you got to bear in mind that, that that denominator matters quite a lot. So I do think that we're going through this slower period, and that means that the neutral rate of interest or the equilibrium Wixellian rate of interest will be lower. So that's why the speech I gave last week, it's on the website, help yourselves. It's about lower for longer. And it's some of the realities that we must face up, and this, these are shared between Canada and the United States, not in the exact decimal points, but the same idea. And so it means that interest rates, the equilibrium rate of interest is not going to go up very much, even when the economy gets to full strength. Uh, it means that if you're uh, hoping to live off you know, a stock of savings, you're not going to get interest rates that you were hoping to get 20 years ago when you made that plan. It means that pension plans may have more trouble making the returns they've promised and that it'll last for a long time. And it means that companies who uh, routinely have, they have a, a notion called a hurdle rate. So they're thinking of investing and the board says, well, what's the return on that investment? Okay, and they go, well, looks like it's around 6%. The board say, no, no way, we want 10%. Well, we want 10%. Well, you can want it all you want. Uh, but that won't happen in this low return world. But if, if companies are walking around with hurdle rates like that, they'll never invest and they'll never get the growth and neither will we. We, won't, we just won't get there. And so I've had companies say to me, gosh, I, 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 was, I was looking at buying this asset and uh, we offered this much and then somebody else snapped it up on an implied rate of return of 4%. That's ridiculous. That's way below our hurdle rate. Well, I say, well, your hurdle rate hasn't gone down since the natural rate went down, has it? <laughs> and those other folks are smart enough to realize that, and so they got it at 4%, which to me sounds like a pretty good number now, doesn't it? So I think that reality is still spreading, and that's all to say that that doesn't mean that uh, we're stagnating. It means we have to understand we're going to be in slower growth, and it has all these implications. And if I say to you the, the Canadian economy will grow at 1.5%, for the foreseeable future, that's its trend line, it sounds discouraging. In the U.S., we, our, our number is like a little higher, like 1.75, because the, the labor force is, is, is a younger workforce, slightly. Well, those are low numbers. So if somebody comes along and says, but you know what, if you sign TPP, we can bump that baby up by 0.2 or 0.3. Well, it's starting to sound like real money, doesn't it? Whereas if you're growing at 2 or 3%, people say, well, let's do TPP, and it sounds like a lot of work, and it's only going to raise from 2.5 to 2.7. You're like, well, it's all a rounding error. It's not a rounding error anymore. So I think these kinds of things uh, we need to take much more seriously, given that every decimal point will matter a lot more to us and to our kids. I'd like you to uh, join me in thanking uh, Governor Polos for a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>